There is a massive scheme to cover up Edison's $5 billion mistake at the San Onofre nuclear generating plant. Back in 2004, Southern California Edison was looking to replace its steam generators. And they went to Mitsubishi and had them built and worked with designers. And back in 2004, their executive, their vice president, was warned in writing that these souped up big generators, they were bigger, they had more tubes, they were packed closer together to all for the bottom line for more profits. They were warned that this was the largest that had been built and that there was anticipated problems. And Edison, in writing, actually admitted that they were concerned that they might not be able to design around these issues. But instead of making the big changes that were needed for the public safety, they rolled the dice, they went ahead with it anyway, and they had these steam generators built that were bigger, hotter, and guess what? They failed. They were supposed to last 40 years, and they lasted only two years. So now, what is Edison supposed to do? Well, the Public Utility Commission was regulating uh, you know, the power in the area, and they were looking at what do we do? Where do we get energy from now? What do we do in the interim? Uh, are these going to be able to be fixed? And so they started asking some questions mostly behind closed doors. Well, here's the problem. Edison had not yet gotten the steam generators permanently in their rates. So now they're faced with, they have this broken product. They don't know if it's even fixable because of the serious design flaws. The reason they made only slight changes when warned was so that they wouldn't have to go through a license amendment and safety review. So what are they going to do now? In addition to just the cost of these steam generators, this is a real safety issue because what shut the generators down was when a radiation leak occurred and they had to immediately shut down one. The other one was already out for service and there was no way with the radiation leak, you know, these plants, this plant is operating on the shores of Southern California, which is heavily populated. Uh, with the ocean on one side and any attempt at evacuation should something happen to the north and, and south, uh, which is not very far because also you have the international border. So this is, a, this is a real problem, child, if something goes wrong. So there's a radiation leak. They have to shut it down. And now they're trying to scramble. What do they do? They haven't put these steam generators permanently in rates. So they now they're broken. How are they going to do that now? and avoid a safety review. So they, the commission decides, okay, we're going to do an investigation. And that's a public utilities commission in California, decides to do an investigation. There's some back channel emails that go on that actually uh, wind up resulting in delays throughout the year of 2012. The leak happened in the first month of 2012. So all throughout 2012, there's some meetings that are going on. These are uh, private meetings with Edison personnel and commission personnel. These are not public proceedings. And during these meetings, what happens is there's discussion of a, an investigation, but they decide to delay it. Finally, in October, uh, they announce they're going to have an investigation and they open it up. There's an administrative law judge assigned by the Public Utility Commission. And then they go into well, how are we going to phase these proceedings? Well, there was discussion by, we're advocates, I'm a public advocate and an attorney and my firm, Aguirre and Severson, represents ratepayers. And so we brought up, look, these aren't even in rates yet. So they have to go apply for them in rates. So they then uh, decide, okay, we're, you do need to do that process. Well now, they're looking at it like there's no way these things are going to be able to put in rates because they're broken and they, there's no way they can fix them because of their design flaws. But the design flaws are not by accident. What was built, what was exactly what was ordered. Okay, and this is by Edison uh, executives after being warned. So that brings us to the end of 2013, uh, 2012 and into early 2013. Well, 
There's a thing called CFEE, and that's mostly backed by the private utilities, and they pay for stakeholders and regulators to fly off to foreign lands and meet at exotic places to discuss uh, very ambiguous energy issues. So they send PV at the time, Commissioner Michael PV. he was president of the Public Utility Commission, over to War Warsaw, Poland, where the uh, conference was, at the lavish Hotel Bristol. And then they send Executive uh, Pickett, Stephen Pickett, over there. And while they're over there, there is a private meeting where they say it only lasted 15 minutes, but the level of detail I'm about to show you uh, belies that. And on Hotel Bristol, Warsaw, Poland, stationary, they ink out term deal points as to what it's going to take to resolve this whole mess Edison finds itself in. Okay? This is within a couple months of the proceedings, the investigation being opened by the commission. So, in handwritten form, they have one, two, three. These are actual deal points that PV supposedly had Pickett, Edison's Pickett, write out at PV's direction. So here's the deal. You have the judge and one of the parties in the proceeding inking out a settlement in private with no one else around. Pickett goes to take the notes. Apparently, according to what's been filed, PV says, no, I'm going to take them. So he takes this stationery, which is a couple pages of notes. PV actually writes on the bottom of it some additional deal points, okay, as far as what happens if they get recovery from Mitsubishi. Who gets that? The rate payers or, the, uh, or Edison, all right? And they, uh, so they ink out exact settlement terms that we'll see a year later wind up being almost what the settlement terms were. PV then has to take these notes, pack them in his suitcase, get on a plane, go through customs, go back to Los Angeles, and there he keeps them in his home. Now, no one knows this. This is all secret. But what happens is there's a hearing. And there's ultimately, for a $5 billion proposed settlement, they have a hearing May 14th, 2014. In the meantime, we're trying to get out records. We are trying to get out communications between Edison and uh, the commission, and they're not forthcoming. You have the Public Utility Commission stonewalling on Public Records Act requests, just, just not giving things up. You have Edison not giving up much in data requests. And we're saying, wait a second, how can you have a hearing about whether this should be in rates when one, they never applied to have them in rates, and then two, you're killing the investigation before there's even an investigation, okay? You're, you're settling the, you're, you're allowing a, uh, a deal to manslaughter when you haven't even investigated, you know, the murder. I mean, it's not over. They just completely abandoned, they being the commission, abandoned the investigation. And that reeked of something really wrong. And so we prodded, and we prodded, and we asked for, uh, you know, motions. Please, don't put this on the backs of the ratepayers. You don't decide how much they pay before you decide whether it's reasonable, whether they should pay. There was nothing to look into Edison's actions as to whether designing and installing these steam generators that were bigger, hotter, faster, okay? There was nothing to determine whether the Edison um, executives were reckless in this regard and in fact we found evidence to the contrary by that 2004 letter from Mitsubishi uh, between them warning them that this was you know probably going to blow and it did so the, what we had was a massive cover-up with Edison when the Commission's help to allow them to kill the investigation and get this in race before anybody could find out what really happened okay so let's go to May 14th. It's almost a year after, it's a little more than a year after the March 2013 meeting in Warsaw, Poland. There, for a $5 billion settlement, there is 20 minutes given to counsel to examine witnesses. 20 minutes for $5 billion 
3.3 of which were going to be borne by uh, ratepayers, taxpayer citizens, and not the executives that made those decisions. So my partner, Mike Aguirre, was counsel at the hearing. He was asking questions. And he asked a question of Edison's president, Litzinger. And he asked him, you know, Mr. Litzinger, did you meet with the commission? Were there, he was trying to get at, were there any secret meetings? Okay. He asked him, now, while you were having secret negotiations with some of the settling parties not invited, you were also having ex-party meetings with members of the commission. True? Okay. And Mr. Litzinger, under oath, stated the only ex-party communications I had with commissioners was following the phase one posed, proposed decision, and it was noticed, meaning noticed to the public. Well, this is in May 14, 2014. When Mike Aguirre tried to ask further questions along that line, the administrative law judge, Melanie Darling, who suddenly, by the way, is off this case on a leave of absence of some sort, unexplained, she uh, tries to stop him. So he gives what's called an offer of proof. That's some things lawyers do to explain why they should be able to follow a certain line of questioning. And he says that it's our contention that there was a representation by the commission. There was going to be an investigation into the reasonableness of Southern California Edison's deployment of the defective steam generators with a promise of an investigation, but an intent not to perform it. He says that there was a ruling that put the investigation into the remote future so as to avoid any investigation. And he says very specifically, it's our position that Mr. Peavy helped to orchestrate this settlement through Mr. Friedman of Turn, which is a, supposedly a consumer group. And it wasn't a settlement negotiation. Okay. So it, he was using words like there was, it was collusive. There was no bona fide basis for settlement. Well, the administrative law judge tried to shut him down. And then ultimately he asked Mr. Peavy. He said to him, you know, he was asking about whether he had met with Turn. Mr. or Commissioner Peavy gave a uh, vague, a, a vague response. So Mr. Geary said, well, what about Southern California Edison? Did he meet with Edison? And that's when Commissioner Peavy blew up. I mean, out of nowhere says, I'm not here to answer your questions. And in a very aggressive stance said, I'm not here to answer your, forgive me, goddamn questions. Shut up, shut up. This is one of the commissioners, the president, that's going to be voting on this. May 14th, 2014. During the three-hour hearing, Aguirre questioned why the settlement talks were held in secret. He also wondered whether PUC President Michael Peavy, who once worked for San Onofre owners Southern California Edison, had had any contact with his former bosses. That would be improper because the PUC must approve the settlement. What about Southern California Edison? Sorry. About Edison? Yeah, I, I'm, Edison. Not, I'm not here to answer your questions. Your I'm not here to answer your god questions. Now, shut up. Shut up. Really? That's how you yeah. perform yourself? Aguirre says he was caught by surprise. I felt like you're now showing your true colors. That means there's something to hide. Now let's fast forward. The commission, uh, of course, as would be expected, they approved the decision of all these term points. Now mind you, no one has known yet about these steam generator notes, all right? All we have here is this record not understanding why President Peavy blew up. We, on behalf of our client, who's, you know, a repayer, we file a notice for rehearing after there's, you know, a rubber stamp on this deal. And that's pending. That's, who knows when they're going to decide that. In the meantime, and by the way, we're the only ones who's filed a notice of rehearing. Every other public advocate did not do that. Um, so then that takes us to the, the decision was uh, uh, issued in November, formally. Well, there becomes uh, some investigations because what happened at San Bruno, where when there was a gas explosion underground of Pacific Gas and Electric pipes and people died, workers of the Public Utility Commission, actually employees there, had actually died just you know being in our house and just literally uh, explosion. Very sad. 
And when there was an investigation into what happened there, the city of San Bruno, to their credit, did public records act requests trying to find out how did this happen, how did this happen? How is this the first time we're hearing there's something wrong with these pipes? Well, they brought suit and ultimately were able to get some emails. And that's when it was exposed that President PV and even Florio, Commissioner Florio, were having back channel communications with, edit, uh, with Pacific Gas and Electric to choose the judge of their, you know, of their choosing. And in fact, one judge was offered and they said, no, 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 remember what he did to us last time, we want a different judge. So they actually were able to pick their own judge with the help of the commission. Okay, complete judge fixing. There was launched investigations, okay, state and federal investigations. There was a felony search warrant issued to go to President Peavy's house in the Los Angeles area. And they had a list of things they were looking for, and it was, again, a felony search warrant issued by a judge. And when the investigator went in there, they made an inventory of things they had taken. They took things from his kitchen table, uh, computers, smartphones, and then they went in his office at his home. And in the office, they found what are now called RSG notes, Hotel Bristol. And RSG, the investigator, you know, that was a little ambiguous. Well, when that was released to the press, Jeff McDonald of the San Diego Union Tribune, to his credit, said, wait, replacement steam generators, okay? And then, all of a sudden, it's out of the bag. Within a couple days of that publication, all of a sudden, Edison files a notice of late filed ex parte. Now, ex parte means meeting secretly without the rest of the parties of a proceeding with the judge, essentially. And so what there, well, I tend to think, and, and my partner and others tend to think that there shouldn't be any private meetings without the parties. Uh, it should be open just like it is in, in superior court. Uh, that even if you look at what the commission proceedings are, they have to be filed within three days of a meeting. You have to notice, hey, everyone, we just met with them all right, three days ago, and here's everything that was discussed. And if there's any documents, you have to actually attach them. So here, Edison, after the Union Tribune published the RSG, uh, you know, that there might be these notes about the San Onofre, Edison files a notice of late filed ex parte two years later, saying that back in March 26, 2013, they met with PV in private in Poland and there were notes taken. Since those notes were released to the public, now the public's asking questions. The press is on it. Everyone wants to know how did this happen? Why wasn't this disclosed? And what were we doing for that year and a half in public proceedings if the judge and the utility, the, the, the wrongdoer, actually had worked out a deal. I mean, what, what, it's a joke. It's a facade of a proceeding, okay? This collusion that appears to have taken place. So it wasn't until recently when all of a sudden the commission now, feeling their backs against the wall, PV retires since then. Let's look at what's happened. PV retires, all right? He has to, he's you know, shamed into retiring, as he should be, in my opinion, okay? And then you have Picker that is made head of the commission. And he says, we're going to have transparency. We're all about transparency. Well, we still don't really know what happened. We don't have the commission and Edison's records as far as what really happened all this time because the commission has not produced records fully when requested. They've stonewalled. And then one of the first orders of business, President Picker, you know, it's like new boss, same as the old boss. He hires lawyers, a criminal lawyer, at almost $900 an hour to do work for the Public Utility Commission, and most of it is responding to Public Records Act requests. Or I shouldn't say responding, it's relating to, because it's not responding because they don't give up their records. And the first, there was a retention for a million dollars, and then it quickly went to a $5 million contract. Now, how does a $5 million contract get approved 
when there's been no proceedings, no public proceedings, stating under the government code certain findings that they believe it's in the best interest of the public entity to provide a, a criminal uh, representation, representation related to a criminal matter for any of its employees. There's been no such public findings. We've asked for that. We've had to file a lawsuit to get records as to how this new deal happened, a $5 million. The reason they hired the lawyers was to deal with public records requests and this whole in investigation of, they're saying, state and federal. Well, that, those are the criminal lawyers they hired. So who are they defending? We've asked them, identify who you're defending. You have to. The way it works under the government code is that if someone is provided a criminal defense, ha they have to request it and the entity, the public agency, has to make certain findings that one, it's in the, they're entitled to it, and it's in the best interest of the entity. Where is that discussion? Where are those findings? Were they ever made? Certainly not publicly. And then if they did make those, how come they won't give up those findings and records? There's, there's not a trace of records to determine how it is they hired those lawyers. So here's what happens, though. When you have lawyers representing you, then suddenly all your communications are protected under privilege. So they bought their right to be quiet and not disclose anything. Here we have the Public Utility Commission spending $5 million on $900 an hour lawyers to not give up records, to not make statements. So Picker, the new president, is supposed to be transparent. He, he's actually hunkered down. You know, he, he's, he's put up barricades, even more than Peavy as far as trying to stop the public from knowing what's really going on. Well, the commission just issued a, you know, a, a request that Edison release their emails. You know, the public commission, uh, utility commission is public. They're supposed to release theirs whenever a member of the public asks for them. That's our policy in California, that the, the government does the public's business openly. So. They won't give up their records. They're hunkering down with their lawyers. They've asked Edison to give up their records. Well, Edison gives up records, and we can see more meetings, more secret meetings, more collusion. But what Edison does when it gives up those records is they have Ronald Litzinger, the same one who testified May 14, 2014, do a declaration. And if you remember, Litzinger said, the only ex parte communication I had with commissioners was following phase one proposed decision and it was noticed. Well, here we are in uh, 2015, okay? He signed this April 29th, 2015 with his signature. And what he says now is on May 14th, 2014, the day of the hearing, the public hearing, the commission held an evidentiary hearing regarding the proposed song settlement. Before the hearing began, President Peavy asked to meet with me. I went to his office and met with him. Commissioner Florio was also present. During the meeting, which just involved non-songs topics as well, President Peavy raised the issue of SCE, Southern California Edison, making a contribution to UC, University of California, for greenhouse gas research. Okay. On the very day that Mike Aguirre was asking questions about whether, he asked Peavy whether he had met with Edison. He asked Litzinger whether he had met with Edison. Peavy blows up. Litzinger says no. And yet here, once busted again, they admit that there was a meeting that very day. No wonder Peavy blew up. He's probably like, how could he have known we just met today? And the records show that there was tons of meetings between Edison and uh, the commissioners. And also between turn, there was 35 private meetings. So you have the Public Utility Commission, supposed to be representing the public, uh, but they pay lawyers to not give up information, to hide records, to make everything under a privilege log of lawyers uh, so they don't have to give things up. And it's only when they're, they're completely busted, the, their backs are against the wall, that they admit just tiny pieces here and there and only what they have to. And you know, basically, 
the, in California, a criminal conspiracy includes when people agree to do acts to obstruct justice. All right. And that's what we have here. We have a criminal conspiracy for the obstruction of justice. Because Lord knows the public was not participating in any of this. What's important about um, Litzinger's admission here in April 29, 2015, is that he's talking about the whole greenhouse gas research. Well, if you look at the notes, it talks about uh, having a, a GR, uh, Greenhouse gas, okay, that was one of the deals here, okay, one of the deal points. So to say that, oh, it's something different, no, this was a deal that was worked out and it was all a, a facade to the public that they had any meaningful participation in it. What we have done is we have filed a lawsuit. And we filed a lawsuit because the Public Utility Commission is not open and their practices have been so collusive. This is so muddied and so tainted this process that there's no way even with the rehearing they can go back and do and, and take a fresh look. So we went to federal court and we filed a lawsuit and we said, Your Honor, just like uh, when years ago when Southern California Edison brought a lawsuit in federal court saying that the commission was doing a public taking, an unconstitutional taking of their money because they were forcing them to provide power at rates higher than originally agreed. The power prices had gone up, the generation prices and transmission prices went up. So what the Public Utility Commission had agreed to for their rates, they actually they were paying higher and they said, look, if you're forcing us to give energy, it's, we haven't been compensated. So it's an unjust taking without compensation. Well. What we did was we filed a lawsuit and said, just like the court was open to Southern California Edison when it was a plaintiff, we're filing a lawsuit saying that without hearings to determine whether it was fair and reasonable, without a, meaningful hearings, which clearly there was not, to force ratepayers to pay $3.3 billion is an unjust, unconstitutional taking without just compensation. And under a loophole, they said, no, you can't have public utility commission heat matters heard in federal court, you, and the doors are shut to you. I mean, that's basically what happened. So we are going to appeal that matter, okay, uh, to the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and we're hoping those doors are open. In the meantime, so you have the executive branch with the governor not taking any action to create real change as far as who he's picking for commissioners. You have the legislative branch under Assemblymember Rendon, who is initiating legislation as far as making some changes, but they, they don't go far enough. To, uh, we give him credit and we're thankful that the legislature is speaking out, but there's a lot more that needs to be done in order for the public to get access to the courts. Senator Hill tried last year to change the um, public utility code so that there would be access to courts and so that just was too late in, in the session it, it didn't go anywhere then you have the judicial branch which closes the door saying no we're not allowed to review the uh, decisions of the public utility commission and then you have the public utility commission who sits on a notice for a rehearing and even if it does choose to rehear it you know that, that, that's the, the same people involved deciding the fate the same people that are hunkering down not providing public uh, documents and, and things like that. So, you know, we have a real mess. What we have is, uh, you know, collusion at the highest levels, and we have no change. And we have, uh, fortunately, a number of advocates who are speaking out and trying to make change. Edison has released emails recently at the uh, demand of the Public Utility Commission, and they withheld a number of emails based on privilege. The Public Utility Commission has done the same, and that's the attorney-client privilege that they're invoking with their $900 an hour lawyer. With Edison, what's interesting is they're holding, by the way, they say there's a couple million documents and they've only produced a couple hundred pages. Um, the, the privilege log, which is a table that the lawyers prepare that says, here's a general description of what we're withholding and we're claiming some kind of privilege. You know, some of it pertains to even, there's a, a 
some involvement of an action plan by, for those San Diego followers, uh, Mark Fabiani, who is the lawyer that represents the Chargers in the whole San Diego Charger deal. He used to be an, uh, work for Edison. And so they apparently have called him back as a, a, as a name they'd like involved in this process. He, he's the one that's trying to move the Chargers from San Diego to uh, Carson or at least work, work out some kind of a deal on the backs of repayers, once again, following that theme. So it, it's what is in those records. We can only assume that what's in those is very damaging. Why doesn't the Public Utility Commission waive attorney-client privilege? What is the danger that the public knows what its own commission is doing? Why is there even a need for uh, that type of um, privilege to be invoked? Who is it protecting? Is it protecting the wrongdoers at the commission? Are we going to find out something that shows it's, it's more collusive than we thought? It doesn't seem to be protecting the public. And that's the problem. And so what's your recourse there? The recourse for getting documents, for having waiver privilege, is filing suit. The problem is when you file suit, they say you can't come to this court because you don't have jurisdiction. The court doesn't have jurisdiction to hear it. You have to go to the Court of Appeals. The problem with the Court of Appeals is it's discretionary. So they can hear it or not. So there is nowhere to go unless the courts decide to hear this, unless we, we get a, a change in the legislature that says, no, they don't have to go to the Court of Appeals, or unless the Public Utility Commission decides to make good on its promise of transparency and actually make transparent those records and waive the privilege that seems to protect only maybe rogue individuals and certainly not the public. What's the best case scenario? It sounds like the, the game is rigged and uh, well, you have no further recourse. We are hoping that there's legislative changes that actually gives public more access. That is needed. That is a must. We are hoping that the ratepayers, the customers, the taxpayers, one, understand what this commission does. It's, it's not something on people's minds every day, what the commission is, and that's half the problem. And it's only by the media covering it, by, by advocate groups covering it, and through you know, things like video and, and print and, and making the public aware. When I know that I go to my local coffee shop and people are talking to me about it, I know we're making progress because no one ever considered where their bill comes from, who regulates it. It's just not on most people's minds. And if their bill goes up a dollar, they might notice it in the long term, but probably not initially. It's not something on the, the forefront of their minds. When you're talking about in Southern California, 17 million people having to their bills go up, I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. And there's no reason that Edison should get away with gambling with people's safety with generators that are too big and leak and put the risk of every Southern California resident, uh, you know, their safety at risk. There's no reason that that should be borne by the ratepayers when right after the settlement was announced in 2014, Edison, the very day they issued a press release for, uh, at the settlement conference, Edison that day had already scheduled and had a conference call with its institutional investors and said everything's great. Stock prices went up. Their shareholders are enjoying profits. And here the ratepayers have to pay $3.3 billion for something that appears to have been from reckless acts and for which a commission is not allowing anyone to take a good look at. So you have here um, both uh, economic and physical, uh, and can you, can you yes. elaborate again mm -hmm. about that? Because I think this is the key. Sure. People don't get it. Sure. What we have is a company called Southern California Edison operating San Onofre at our shores. You have the plant being shut down because of a safety issue, something that was foreseen and actually came to fruition and caused a radiation leak and fortunately was shut down quickly. It would have been disastrous had it not. But fortunately, there was a leak and it shut down. So now you have safety issues for the public as far as then that they gambled with. Now you have spent nuclear fuel sitting on our shores, okay? And what do we do with it now? 
They're saying just let's put it in some concrete uh, casks and leave it there because there's no real policy on where to put spent fuel. You know, one of the problems just <coughs> with the nuclear industry, and, and it's criticized in some ways because everyone's happy to build the plants and get some power going, but what do you do when the plants close? Where do you put these tombs of nuclear waste that are, you know, highly radioactive? Especially on the shores here when, you know, it could be vulnerable for even terrorist attack or, or just, you know, danger. We're, we're at an earthquake zone in Southern California Edison. Look what happened at Fukushima. Okay. So there are so many risk levels to have store this radiation here. And this is the company that we are charging with being responsible to make sure these are stored correctly. So the issues are both safety and then from an economic standpoint, with San Onofre, this $3.3 billion is just for these generators that they were warned were going to fail and did. So the public paid for energy it didn't get. It paid for equipment that didn't produce the energy. They had to actually go buy replacement energy. So everything is on the backs of the public. And now, uh, so not only are we paying for the, the broken generators, we're going to be paying for this nuclear waste. And how do we close down the plant and move it? And it's all at the helm of uh, Edison with their help from their brothers and sisters at the Public Utility Commission, which appear to be so collusive and there's no change in sight. So that's a real problem. The public needs to speak out. The public needs to become aware. The public needs to write their legislators. The public needs to write the governor. And they, there needs to be movement by the masses so that they get this dangerous uh, equipment off and have it be operated as it's being decommissioned uh, properly and not by, you know, the fox guarding uh, the hens. They, like if there's a, a rogue judge that was doing some kind of fixing, every single action that judge was on gets called into question. Every defendant gets to come back and open up their case. Why isn't that being done here with every matter before the Public Utility Commission? I mean, it's so pervasive, why shouldn't smart meters be reopened and everything be reopened, okay? And that's, that's a big issue.